Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Have you ever experienced a conversation sort of like the one I demonstrated to the kids? Maybe not quite so exaggerated, but where you're only trying to communicate something to someone and you can tell that they're only waiting for their turn to talk. They're not really listening to what you have to say. They want to fix a problem, maybe. A problem that you don't want them to fix. I'm looking at the men out there, myself included. Maybe they just want to get their word in, in response to what you've said, rather than really understand what you're communicating. If you're like me, you've experienced both sides of this yourself. Times when I speak and the other person, I can tell, isn't really listening. They've decided that their response to whatever I said is more important than really hearing my own words. But I have also, you can ask my wife, have been the one who speaks when he should listen. And I've likely even done this to some of you as your pastor. And for that, I'm sorry. And if you're out there thinking, I've never done this to anyone, I can pretty much guarantee that you have. And precisely because you can't see it, it's likely a greater weakness for you than you realize. And you should ask the people in your life, the ones you trust to be honest with you, to tell you if this is the case. After all, no one, including the people who do this, appreciate it. No one likes to be in a conversation with somebody who doesn't listen and has to get their word in. Well, this sinful human failing is on full and dramatic display in our gospel reading today. So much so that God the Father himself shows up to tell the person speaking in so many words, be quiet, listen to him. So before we get to the Mount of Transfiguration, today is the Sunday of the church where we celebrate getting a glimpse of the glory of God in Jesus. And when Jesus gives some of his disciples a glimpse of this on the mountain, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But we've taken quite a jump in the book of Matthew. I don't know if you noticed, but last week we were in chapter 5, and now we're all the way in chapter 17. But this is really a good way to summarize the season of the church here that's coming to a close, the season of Epiphany. If you recall, back at the very beginning of the season of Epiphany, we were celebrating the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3. And almost to the letter, God the Father speaks the same phrase. At Jesus' baptism, God the Father shows up, the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove, and God speaks from the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now, it's not exactly the same in our gospel reading today. He adds a little bit at the end, which we'll talk about in a moment. But this is the epiphany, the revelation from God that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, no mere prophet, no mere lawgiver, but God in the flesh come to save his people. So what has Jesus been up to between chapter 3 and chapter 17? Nothing short of preaching and teaching and doing miracles, all displaying that the kingdom of heaven is breaking into creation even now as he speaks. We began to hear some of his teaching. Right? He does this in two ways. He teaches and he performs miracles. And we heard some of this teaching when we were looking in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthews chapter 4 and 5 teachings that intensify what the law really says when God gave it to us. Then he goes on to do numerous parables, some you're probably familiar with, the parable of the sower, the parable of the weeds, the parable of the hidden treasure, and the pearl of great value, all pointing to the coming of the kingdom of God in him. And he's doing a lot of miracles as well, miracles of healing. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. He heals a man of leprosy, a man of paralysis. He heals the centurion's servant, a blind and demon-possessed man. He raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. He feeds the 5,000 and then the 4,000 and walks on water. All of these things are done to point to the epiphany, 
the revelation of who Jesus is and what he has come to bring. But perhaps most important of all throughout these chapters, he's revealing to his disciples who he really is. And this kind of comes to a culmination in the chapter right before our gospel reading today in chapter 16. And Jesus asks his disciples this question. He says, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they say, well, some, of you think, some people think you're a great prophet. Or you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Or Elijah, the Elijah who is to come. But then Jesus asks them pointedly, but who do you say that I am? And here is where we get Peter's great confession of faith. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the epiphany. That's the revelation. And Jesus' response to Peter is to say a blessing. Blessed are you, Peter, for my heavenly Father has revealed this to you. God gave and Peter received the true identity of Jesus. And then Jesus follows that up by mentioning that upon this rock, this confession, this revelation that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, he's going to build his church on that foundation. And then he gives the church its first gift, the keys to the kingdom of heaven, that the apostles are able to speak forgiveness of sins as if Christ himself is speaking it. And today, of course, that is carried out through the office of divinely instituted office of the pastor. Then Jesus predicts his passion. In verse 21 of 16, he says this, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. In all these things, Jesus is pointing his disciples to the revelation of God that he is the Christ who has come to save his people from their sins. And you might be wondering if everything is going so well, Peter's got the identity of Jesus totally right, what do we need the Mount of Transfiguration for? Why does it even occur? Why does Jesus give us a glimpse of his glory? Well, it's because one last thing happens between Peter and Jesus after he makes this proper confession. Peter hears what Jesus has to say about what the Christ is to do, namely suffer and die at the hands of sinful men, and he takes Jesus aside, yes, the same Jesus who moments before he said was the Son of the living God, he takes that Jesus aside and he rebukes him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And we're all collectively thankful that Jesus did not listen to Peter, for then we would not be gathered in joy. Jesus does not bless this response. In fact, he says his harshest words to his disciples. He says, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. The word hindrance there in English and Greek means stumbling stone or stumbling block. So Peter went from being someone who's pointing to the foundational stone of the church to being a stone in the path of Jesus. And then he rebukes him for saying, you are thinking of the things of men and not the things of God. Now before you get too hard on Peter, when Peter speaks in the book of Matthew, his voice is representing the 12 disciples. It's not just Peter who doesn't understand. None of them do. And now we've arrived at the Mount of Transfiguration. And again, the folly of our focus on the things of man, our own ideas, our own words, rears its ugly head. In other words, we speak when we should listen. The epiphany again shines into creation on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is no mere prophet, no mere man sent by God. He is transfigured before you, the Christ, the Son of the living God. His face shines like the sun. If any of you are like me, you foolishly looked straight at the sun once before. It's very bright. For those of you who haven't, just take our word for it and don't do it. His clothes become white as light, and then Moses and Elijah appear. But notice, Moses and Elijah are not transfigured. Only Jesus is transfigured. 
So Moses and Elijah represent the great lawgiver of the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. Elijah was the prophet who never died. He was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire. So Jesus is clearly not the Elijah to come, and he's not here to bring new laws, and he's not John the Baptist. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, in full glory. So imagine you're there for a moment, the God of the universe in full glory in front of you, Moses and Elijah, great history, historical men from the history of your people, and then Peter interrupts their conversation together. Moses and Elijah appear, and they're talking to Jesus, because what do Moses and Elijah know? They know the whole story is about Jesus, and their part to play is done. Peter doesn't, and so he interrupts. Now, it's important to note that Peter doesn't say anything wicked. He doesn't say something evil. His problem is that he's talking when he should be listening. And because he's talking when he should be listening, his words are ignorant of the truth. You see, Jesus brought these three disciples, Peter, James, and John, up on the mountain to witness his glory, to remind them of what he's really here to do. In other words, he's brought them there to give them a gift, a revelation of the truth. Yet Peter, rather than listen and receive what Jesus is teaching, just like he did six days ago, he speaks his own words and his own ideas. And he also speaks ignorantly because he's speaking as if Moses, Elijah, and Jesus are all the same level of important. He gives them all the same honor. Let us make a dwelling for all three of you. At this point, I sometimes wonder what's got to be going through the minds of Moses and Elijah. They're like, Jesus, this guy, he's one of your disciples? He doesn't seem to notice who you are, even though you're standing right in front of him in all your glory. And yet, he does. And if that isn't bad enough, we know this is an interruption because of what comes next. The very next sentence begins with, He was still speaking when? He was still speaking when God the Father shows up in a bright cloud and says again the epiphany. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. But this time he adds a phrase to the end of that. Listen to him. I don't know about you, but if God the Father showed up in a conversation where I was talking when I should be listening, I would react the same way the disciples do. Because for the first time on the Mount of Transfiguration, they finally realize where they're at. They're in the presence of the Holy Almighty God. And they fall on their faces terrified. That's what happens when sinful people are in the presence of a holy God. Fear. But then we get this beautiful picture in the next verse. That Jesus does the very thing that the Christ of God came to do. He doesn't leave his disciples alone in their fear. He walks to them and touches them has mercy on them and says, rise and do not be afraid. That's what he has come to do. Rescue sinful disciples from the just wrath of God. And the text tells us that they stand up and look around and the only person left is Jesus. Remember, he fulfills the Old Testament and the prophets. He fulfills the law. And so now only he remains. Only he who comes in mercy. Only he who touches you and says, be at peace. Rise and have no fear. This interaction beautifully demonstrates how God interacts with mankind. God speaks and we listen. He gives and we receive. His words and his presence strike fear into the sinful human disciple. Our confession of sin is not a light thing at the beginning of every service. And yet, what does the Christ of God do through the words given to the apostles one chapter before? He comes to you and touches you in mercy and says, your sins are forgiven. 
fear dispelled. His words then later on in the service given as a gift to us, just like the gift of the true revelation of Jesus given to Peter. And they're spoken by Jesus so that we can listen to him and receive what he has come to give us. As Jesus, the Son of the living God's journey to Jerusalem to do the things of God, as he does these things, as we enter into the season of Lent, let us be quiet when he speaks so we can receive the things of God in Jesus. For they are the greatest of all things given from God to men. They are the things that turn fear into peace, sorrow into joy, and death into eternal life. They are the forgiveness from sin and freedom from the fear of the wrath of a just and holy God. They are a new spirit from God himself and a new heart. A heart that can show mercy, love the unlovable, and share the peace it now enjoys in Christ. They are life eternal, won through the suffering, death, and resurrection of the Son of the living God, and given freely of grace to you in the sacraments of holy baptism, where he claims you as his own, and in holy communion, where he gives you the fruits of the cross, a new life in Jesus. Dear friends in Christ, Jesus is no mere man. He is the Christ of God the Son of a living and holy God, and He comes to you today in mercy through His Word and His gifts. Rise and have no fear, He says to you, and when you look around, only He remains. Listen to Him. In the name of Jesus, amen.